They belong to one of the most exclusive clubs in the world, whose membership is only one requirement. And it's not who you know, what you do, or even what you look like, but how young you are and how much money you make. Young and rich is such a phrase that everyone aspires to be. Most people think, oh, I would love to have that. I would love to be that successful. I would love to be that rich. There's a large element of jealousy, but I also think there's admiration. If I'd have been as rich as these kids are in high school, I would have bought my parents a different home. I would have said, guess what? We're no longer roommates. What we're seeing today is that with the rise of social media, people become very famous very quickly. It seems like the hot age just gets younger and younger and younger. Some of this is, hey, I've got a million Twitter followers. There's got to be a way to monetize this. Back in the day, when you think of a billionaire, you think of an old tycoon like wearing a suit. Now you have this new paradigm of like a nerdy, antisocial, awkward guy. You have people frequently in their 20s coming in and buying cars because it's the best car to have and they can afford it. They are the youngest members of the richest 1%, and the roads they've taken to join this club range as wide as the gap between the haves and the have-nots. They are under 21 and filthy rich. Hilton is appearing in court this morning, a day after her controversial early release from jail. Nicole Ritchie, she was arrested Monday for suspicion of driving under the influence. Late last night, the pop princess shaved her head. He eventually declared bankruptcy, his childhood fortune gone. The road to riches is fraught with peril, and disaster looms at every turn. For many, the combination of outrageous sums of money and youth can be a volatile one. You ever seen one of those documentaries about people who win the lottery and it always screws up their life? Uh, you know... They have one of those about celebrities, too. It's called the MC Hammer behind the music. But before you can spend an outrageous fortune, you have to make one. And often for a young Hollywood star, the most effective way of doing that is to be cast in a motion picture franchise. Movie franchises are really interesting things. They can take children and make them into megastars overnight. The dream scenario for any young person in Hollywood is to become attached to a big franchise. When you're attached to that kind of franchise, and that franchise goes on to make one, two, three, four, five movies, you're able to make a lot of money. Let's talk a little bit about Daniel Radcliffe. It is good to be Harry Potter. In 2001, an 11-year-old Daniel Radcliffe signed on to play the role of Harry Potter. Eight films later, his net worth stands at approximately $80 million. By the time he finished the last installment, he was making $25 million. What is a wizard going to do with all that money? He was probably the biggest star of the last 10 years, but he's incredibly sensible and down to earth. <laughs> Oh yeah, it's funny, because it's, it's weird, because they see somebody here that I don't, it's very strange. He likes to spend his money on books and real estate. He bought two pieces of property in New York City, both around $5 million. It's fantastic when, you know, a Daniel Radcliffe steps out and says, you know what, I'm, I'm really, I'm conservative with my money and I'm careful because I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, so this is how I live my life. But there is a rumor that he actually spent $17,000 on a mattress. I guess when you're a wizard, you have to get a good night's sleep. And he needs to be well rested. Since venturing outside the walls of Hogwarts, Radcliffe has made a concerted effort to define himself as an actor, taking turns on Broadway in both Equus and How to Succeed in Business. His turn on Broadway was very well received. It made people look at him in a different way and take him a little more seriously. That's going to be very important for his career. When Daniel Radcliffe was on Broadway in New York, he stayed away from that kind of celebrity nightlife scene. He stayed true to himself. This is a guy who busts his butt on Broadway. He did not want to miss anything of how to succeed in business without really trying. Even when he had the Harry Potter premiere, they made sure they did that premiere in New York on a Monday when Broadway is dark so that he was not missing too many performances. He has a passion for acting and drama. I predict for him a kind of a prestigious career, you know, where he chooses the projects that he wants because he has that financial 
foundation that he made from the Harry Potter films, he can do whatever he wants and he'll be okay. Daniel Radcliffe wasn't the only young actor to have his life transformed by the Harry Potter films. Emma Watson, at the time only nine years old, was cast to play the role of Hermione. She's made pretty actually listed six on the Forbes Young People list in 2010. And she's made about $45 million. The older Emma Watson gets, the more amazing she seems. I mean, this is a girl who has a really good head on her shoulders. Emma Watson said that she didn't even realize that she was a millionaire until she was like 17 years old because the money was sort of hidden from her. She was only getting a $75 a week allowance from her parents. It wasn't until she was 18 that they told her how much money she was worth. If Watson's parents thought that telling Emma her true net worth would trigger a giant spending spree, they were wrong. That's not to say, however, there wouldn't be an occasional splurge. Fashion something that you splurge on. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess it is. That's probably like what I spend most of my money on, so yeah. <laughs> but for the most part, Watson's purchases have been practical. Emma Watson has said that she doesn't spend all her millions from Harry Potter in a crazy way. In fact, her biggest purchases were probably a laptop computer, a sensible car when she got her driving license, and also her education. When she was at Brown University, she was staying in a dorm room with five girls, and she wanted that kind of typical experience. Emma Watson is a great example of somebody who was associated with this massive franchise for the longest time. And she has done two very interesting things, which is one, she's gone to an Ivy League university, and two, um, she's associated very tightly with Burberry. With high profile endorsement deals, Watson is emerging as a fashion icon. She's been a spokesperson for Burberry and a spokesperson for Lancome. And we're pretty sure those were six digit figures that she got to do those campaigns. Like his colleagues, the third member of the Harry Potter triumvirate, Rupert Grint, won his role in the Harry Potter films at a very young age. Over the course of the film series, he's earned $40 million. Probably the person who spent his money, kind of the strangest from the Harry Potter series, is Rupert Grint. He's bought things like a nice cream truck and a tractor he's actually said he's made so much money he doesn't know what to do with it the redheaded kid i'm a little worried about him rupert grant has admitted that he's made some questionable purchases he definitely spent his money a little bit more freely as well but you know he's a he's a ginger so their priorities are all completely different the kids in harry potter have grown up in this movie We've watched them go from 10-year-olds to 20-year-olds, and this is all they've ever known. They all have a ton of money. So what do they do now? They can slowly start to build themselves up as actors who are recognized for different work, but it can be very, very challenging for kids. After eight films watched by millions of fans the world over, Radcliffe, Watson, and Grint face a formidable challenge in overcoming their association with their iconic roles. A challenge so big, it shall not be named. Dan, Rupert and I have all moved on to other projects and we've been working really hard on, on, you know, what's next for us. Being cast in a major Hollywood franchise is not the only way to join the club of the young and rich. You could also be from Canada and put videos of yourself singing on YouTube. For Justin Bieber, worth an estimated $85 million, that worked just fine. He was nowhere two years ago. I mean, who had heard of Justin Bieber? Last year he earned something like, you know, $55 million. It's a really young age to have so much money. He's ranked number two on the Forbes rich list under 30. He had a movie that grossed over $100 million and a perfume that in three weeks sold over $3 million. Bieber fever's rapid spread across North America shined a spotlight on an emerging new business model for the music industry, where YouTube plays a major role. People like Justin Bieber have figured out a whole new way of marketing themselves. Justin Bieber is a, a great example of someone that was discovered on the internet. Who would have thought that you could have gone on YouTube and parlayed your performances into a $53 million career? He's selling a product, he's selling music. That's what it's all about, and that's what the internet's really leveled the playing field for. The young fans of today are never exhausted. They will go do a Google search, and anything about Justin Bieber they will read, even if it's just the clip of him kissing Selena Gomez when he wins an American Music Music Award. There's a real, just voracious quality to the to these young fans today. Although he currently enjoys tremendous popularity, Bieber's story, as documented in 2011's Never Say Never, has humble beginnings. He was raised by his mother and from a fairly low class. I mean, he and his mom were sharing a meal and getting water instead of the soda that he wanted when he was a little kid. But almost one billion YouTube hits later, he's learned to enjoy his success a little bit. 
He's someone who vowed from a very young age that when he got it, he was gonna enjoy it. How does Justin Bieber like to spend his money? Well, he actually bought Kid Rock's tour bus. I guess that's one of the people that he really, really admires. I think about Justin Bieber spending money. I think about a kid who's madly in love with his girlfriend and just showers her with gifts. He recently rented out the entire Staples Center in Los Angeles for a date with Selena Gomez so they could watch Titanic. In October 2005, Stephanie Meyer published the first of a series of books about a love triangle between a 105-year-old vampire, a 17-year-old girl, and a high school-age shape-shifting werewolf named Jacob. When all was said and done, it was a $2 billion idea. Every generation has this film that just blows the world away, that they fall in love with, that people will wait in line for weeks sleeping on the floor in sleeping bags in tents just to get a glimpse of Rob Pattinson and a glimpse of Kristen Stewart, which we found with the Twilight franchise. I mean, you take the box office revenue, the DVD revenue, the books, the posters, every spin-off, everything, to billions of dollars. For the Twilight franchise, the sky's the limit. The stars of Twilight quickly became household names, and America found itself choosing between Team Edward and Team Jacob, while Robert Pattinson, Kristen Stewart, and Taylor Lautner saw their earnings soar to astronomical heights. So let's talk a little bit about Robert Pattinson. Playing the dead has been very, very good for him. Robert Pattinson actually started in Harry Potter. A lot of people saw him in that movie and thought he's going to be something. So it was no surprise when Twilight came around and he became one of the world's hottest leading men. You can't tell just by looking at Robert that he spends a lot of money on anything. He's kind of the guy who rolls out of bed and looks like he just loves his bed head and just rolls out and puts on whatever he wants to wear. Pattinson looks like a homeless person most of the time. I don't know how that guy spends his money. Pattinson's partner on screen and in real life is Kristen Stewart. Playing Bella has actually made her $28 million, but we all know that dating Edward is priceless. The thing with Rob Pattinson and Kristen Stewart and I think this is also why they're a romantic couple in real life. They truly did never set out to become huge global movie stars. For Kristen Stewart, she's had that tomboy appeal. She was showing up in sneakers, jeans, t-shirts, even the things like the MTV Movie Awards. She just was that typical indie actress. It's interesting because she actually tends to get involved in charities that kind of coincide with the movies that she's doing. When she played a diabetic in Panic Room, she got involved in diabetes charities. When she was working on Welcome to the Rileys, she got involved in different charities for runaway teenagers. I mean, this is a really smart, good way to spend your money. You'll still see them doing the exact same things they used to do. They might have to bring a couple bodyguards to protect them from fans. But other than that, they're going to shows. Rob's still eating his Hot Pockets and from a microwave that he loves. They seem to be buying things for other people. They're buying homes for their families, or there even was a report that Robert Pattinson bought a guitar for a homeless person. I think that they're very humble kids, and I think that they have a good head on their shoulders. The third wheel to Bella and Edward is Taylor Lautner, who's made $40 million playing Jacob, which is unofficially estimated at $234,000 per shirt. Taylor Lautner, he just kind of came out of nowhere. It was really the second movie that Team Edward versus Team Jacob really came to the forefront. Now, what does Taylor like to spend his money on? What every boy likes to spend his money on, fast cars. One of the must-haves is a nice car. But instead of getting a Honda Civic, he gets $200,000 Mercedes. Taylor Lautner is the most open about spending money. He's living the life. He's like, come on, let's, uh, we've got all this uh, vampire werewolf money, let's spend it. Like his two co-stars are just kind of like touching each other's hair and like, you know, watching old French movies probably in their trailers. And he's like, let's uh, live a little. Seems that Taylor Lautner is trying to go more of a superhero role. He's been filming a lot more action sequences an action film, so perhaps it's gonna kind of take over Tom Cruise's role. I don't think he has a ton of dramatic range, but he's very uh, cute and all of the girls love him, but that's all contingent upon him keeping his abs. If he goes soft in his midsection, then all bets are off. An important thing to think about with these people specifically from the Twilight franchise, what are they gonna do next? It's gonna be super challenging for them to replicate their earnings. The challenge for Rob, Kristen, and Taylor is going to be transitioning from Twilight to that next role so that people don't call them by their Twilight names the rest of their lives. You don't want to have Kristen Stewart accepting an Oscar and people are saying, yay, Bella. Everybody on television under the age of 20 is a vampire. So no matter what vampire you are, you could probably still have a career because you'll go, oh, no, that was the other vampire. 
That wasn't me. No, no. I was a good vampire. As the odds came to a close, a new force in music forged in social networking sites such as MySpace continued to emerge. Taylor Swift's aw shucks personality and youthful fan base belied a serious artist with a pinpoint focus on her music and fans that would soon elevate her to superstar status. Taylor Swift is arguably one of the youngest, brightest, biggest stars of our generation. She performs on the Grammys. She has a cover girl contract. I mean, these are things that huge superstars have. Taylor Swift has actually been number five two years in a row on the Young and Rich list for Forbes. She's hugely successful. She's worth $45 million. She's the most successful digital artist out there. She's actually sold 34 million digital tracks. Today you see so many celebrities that, you know, quote unquote, hit it big overnight. But in all reality, they started 10 years ago. It's taken years to get to where they are today. However, to the general public, because we just heard of them, we think that it happened overnight. Taylor spent years on the road talking to fans she would sit out there and do five to six hours of meet and greets signing autographs taking pictures with her fans to make sure that every last one of them got their photo got the autograph and got an opportunity to meet her taylor swift is the one who understood how to use her myspace back when people still cared about myspace to communicate directly with her fans Swift maintains a clean-cut image with fans. However, she'll occasionally make a splash with the tabloids by dating some of Hollywood's most high-profile single men. She has capitalized on a lot of short-lived romances. I mean, she'll date somebody for two months and then an entire album comes out about how she got over that person. The one thing you will have to admit with Taylor is if you date her, there's a good chance you're going to end up on her next record. When it comes to managing her money, Swift is very hands-on. She relies on the counsel of her mother, but also takes a very active role in her own management. Taylor Swift's someone who's been very smart with her money. Um, she's also someone who's had a really great family life, um, and a mom who's there everywhere you turn. She is not a flashy person. She doesn't wear flashy clothes. She doesn't drive flashy cars. And if she does throw down a huge chunk of money, she's spending money on people like her parents. Nothing ridiculous. She hasn't bought like an island or a lion or a bear or anything like that yet. Over the years, the model of the boy band has evolved. When the Jonas Brothers arrived as wholesome, likable young stars who could play their own instruments, they took it to a whole new level. The Jonas Brothers are these wholesome, really great guys who you want your daughters to date. The minute that they got big, stock and promise rings just through the roof, and uh, I think teen pregnancy actually went down, so... Good work, Joe Bros. The Jonas Brothers actually play their own musical instruments, write their own songs, and they really are a class act. I think the thing that the Jonas Brothers did that was amazing was they had a stylist who said you always have to wear tight pants. Girls always go crazy for guys in tight pants. If I had to narrow it down to any one thing, it was the tight pants that pushed them over the top. The Jonas Brothers' net worth right now is over 30 million. Do they spend their money? Yeah, they do. You know, they like a nice pair of shoes or they like to give their mom a Rolex for Christmas. He was barely 18, but Nick Jonas said, it's time for me to get out of my parents' house and you know, step away from my brother. So he actually bought his own bachelor pad in the W Hotel in Los Angeles. And he's living the single life there. But the inevitable question is, what's next? And with the Jonas Brothers, you see them getting to an age where they're starting to mature and they feel like they want to express themselves artistically. They're smart about it. They're not just staying in the recording industry. You know, they're branching out, they've got merchandise, they're becoming producers. So they're really kind of turning into these mini moguls. Following in the footsteps of Daniel Radcliffe, Nick Jonas will also be going to Broadway to star in appropriately enough how to succeed in business. Nick Jonas, he's somebody who's gotten a lot of fame at an early age with a very specific persona. He's one of the Jonas Brothers. He's one of those kids. He's one of those brothers. By going on to Broadway, if he can have as well-received a turn in how to succeed in business as Daniel Radcliffe did, I think it's going to make a really big difference for his career going forward as an adult. In the fraternity of the young and rich, there are those who made their fortune signing on to major film franchises, those who strapped on a guitar and played to the country's tweens. And then there are the young and rich whose careers have been expertly handled to the very last detail who still managed to have a somewhat normal life. The young star who really has impressed me the most is Dakota Fanning. Dakota's whole career, it seems like it's this strategic kind of a thing that she's planned out every step. She has a strong management team behind her. Her parents have encouraged her to 
have as normal of a childhood and upbringing as she possibly can have while being in the public eye. You know, she's getting $4 million a film. That's a lot of money for someone who's not even 21 yet. You feel very often like these packaged stars, whether it's someone like J-Lo, whether it's someone like Selena Gomez, you know, they have to have an album, they have to have a clothing line, they have to have a movie, they have to have a TV show. So it's almost like they're just going through the checklist. Whereas Dakota just is in interesting, amazing movies. Sharing the screen with such heavyweights as Tom Cruise, Denzel Washington, and Sean Penn has given Fanning leading lady credibility in a way few actresses her age have ever enjoyed. If I had already been, you know, rubbing elbows and had inside jokes with Sean Penn by the time I was a freshman in high school, are you kidding? I would have been name dropping all over the high school halls. Tom Cruise sought her out to be in War of the Worlds, and she also likes to stay true to her girly, younger roots by doing things like Charlotte's Web that everyone her age would have wanted to see. She jumped past awkwardness, and now she's like this gorgeous girl who's gonna now be the star of all these movies as an adult. She stopped to get a normal high school education. She was a cheerleader and a prom queen, and I mean, people didn't hate you already, Dakota. <laughs> they probably hate your normal, famous life now. She doesn't flaunt what she has, and the same goes for her sister. I think she's got a great role model to look up to. 13-year-old Elle Fanning seems poised to one day give her sister Dakota a run for her money, with a lead role in the J.J. Abrams Steven Spielberg film Super 8, and a net worth of $1.5 million. Dakota's younger sister Elle has actually already escaped being the younger sister of Dakota Fanning. She starred in a very successful movie, and for her, she has this very fashionable, sleek, elegant style about her that magazines like Teen Vogue, like Elle, like InStyle are clamoring to have her model for their covers. Elle Fanning is only one of the up-and-coming young stars filling out the ranks of the young and rich who may not yet be household names. Keyword, yet. Jennifer Lawrence is a really interesting example of a young actress who took some big risks with her roles in movies. Winter's Bone was a movie that not that many people saw, but she got nominated for an Oscar for this role. Jennifer Lawrence sits on the precipice of superstardom, landing the role of Katniss Everdeen in The Hunger Games. Once you're nominated for an Oscar, it sort of opens up all sorts of doors for serious parts for you. She's Katniss in The Hunger Games. That's a movie that we're looking at four films from three books. This has the potential to rival Twilight. You know, I, I don't think it would be unusual to see her getting $15 million by the last two movies. Jennifer Lawrence is going to be enormous. She already was nominated for an Oscar. That's like how she's coming into the game. With the Harry Potter franchise ending and the Twilight franchise ending next year with the Hunger Games, she's going to be huge. From film stars, we move on to a look at those who made their mark on the small screen. Who is the highest paid child actor on TV? At $250,000 per episode, the answer may surprise you. We'll give you two and a half guesses. Beginning his career at the age of six, Angus T. Jones was the first child actor producers saw for the role of Jake Harper on Two and a Half Men. Sometimes child stars you don't even realize had become millionaires before their 21st birthday, like Angus Jones from Two and a Half Men. Obviously, he's not making as much as Charlie Sheen made, and he's not making as much as John Cryer made either. But he's a young star who is still making a lot of money. He started off so young on the show, and right now he's the highest paid child actor on TV. He earned over $15 million to date. He's in a situation like many young child stars who come up on television, which is that we see them every week. So we watch them grow, and we as an audience become very invested in them as a character, but also as a person. I think that he has really held his own on that show, especially considering all the turmoil with Charlie Sheen dropping out and Ashton Kutcher coming. He seems to be a guy who's just sort of weathering that storm. She shared the big screen with Jack Black and Steve Carell and is the country's highest paid female child star. But to many, 18-year-old iCarly star Miranda Cosgrove is unknown. For someone like Miranda Cosgrove, ask any young tween, they will absolutely know who she is. Ask someone in their 30s and 40s who isn't a parent, they actually may not know who she is. People know Miranda Cosgrove from her show on Nickelodeon, from her record, and you know, it's a very specific kind of a niche group. It's sort of the Nickelodeon audience, but that's a very big audience, and they could certainly keep her working for the rest of her career. Kids love iCarly, and they want the lunchbox and the backpack and everything. They want Carly. They relate to Miranda Cosgrove in a way, too, but they're buying the character. Miranda Cosgrove 
is Carly. It's the character and the brand that is creating all of the money. Miranda is a very successful actress. She makes over $180,000 per episode. So for her, she has this challenge of how can she take that to the next level. Selena Gomez, star of Wizards of Waverly Place, is another young star carving out a successful career for herself. To me, Selena Gomez is super cute and has the potential to kind of break out of, of that child star thing. Gomez is equally well known for being the girlfriend of Justin Bieber. Every smart celebrity knows your star rises a little bit higher when you date someone else who is relevant as well. So does it help Selena Gomez to be associated as Justin Bieber's girlfriend? I think it does to some extent. It makes Justin Bieber seem a little more grown up to be in a relationship with somebody like that. And for Selena Gomez, it gives her a ton more face time than she would have gotten otherwise. It makes them more interesting, and it makes magazine readers more interested in them, and makes movie producers and other people more interested in booking. If you think the young and rich are made up of just actors, actresses, and tween recording stars, you'd be forgetting the many athletes and entrepreneurs under the age of 21, whose fortunes eclipse the GDP of a number of third world countries. If you're young and you want to make a ton of money, become an athlete. I mean, these guys make more money than anybody. You can really be launched into the stratosphere if you have the right marketing and image. They get endorsements because there's a certain fan base that really responds well to that. Athletes and endorsements, I think it's, it's two-pronged. You sort of, you have to win, you have to perform well, you have to succeed, but you also have to bring some charisma and some X factor to the table. People look at Sean White as, as somewhat of a rock star. There's not too many people like Sean White. He's one point of one percent in the snowboarding world. Sean White is a great example of somebody who has really taken a lot of care in managing his career and creating something for the long run. Through his snowboarding career, he's actually secured several multi-million dollar endorsements. The team that a snowboarder rides for is a brand. Regular team sports, you know, you play for the San Diego Padres or you play for the Los Angeles Dodgers. In snowboarding, Sean White plays for Burton, and he plays for Target, and he plays for um, Red Bull. Sean White's clearly ridden this popularity of extreme sports. This means getting on television. This means his events in the Olympics. Twenty years ago, it would be inconceivable for an athlete in his sport to have that kind of profile. But he has appeal. He's, he's a perfect example of a guy who has winning results but also has some built-in charisma and he's built this, this real empire. A walking marketing tornado, White has expanded from simple print ads in magazines to commercial promotion, to even designing his own video games and clothing line. John White's pretty unique in that respect. We'll see pro model snowboards on pro model skateboards, of course. But as far as getting your own clothing line, that's, that's, that's new to somebody like Sean White. He's at Hollywood parties, he's on, he's on mainstream you know, magazine covers and uh, you know these talk shows and that's nothing that any snowboarder um, before him has really um, experienced. I think a lot of athletes could learn from what Sean White does. These guys can do anything once they establish themselves as a brand. It's not easy to do but I think that's what Sean White has done and he will make money in perpetuity now because he can keep managing that brand even as he gets older. For athletes the message resonates loud and clear. Excelling on the field can bring the glory but hawking a product can bring the cash. The key, of course, is matching up the demographic with the right athlete, with the right product, and suddenly you can have an amazing trifecta right there. Over the course of a career which started at 14, professional golfer Michelle Wee routinely made more money plugging companies such as Sony, Nike, and Omega than she did on the actual golf course. Her earnings from endorsements have been reported to be as high as $19 million. Michelle Wee, from a marketing perspective, brings a lot to the table and went to Stanford. I mean, there's a lot to like. You know, for her, it would be nice if the success kept pace with the marketing profile and she had a few more titles and were making a bit more splash as a, as a professional golfer. Wee's high endorsement profile, despite winning so few major tournaments, is not unprecedented. She's a credible enough golfer, so you don't worry about this Anna Kornikova syndrome where it's all style over substance. But I think if she were to win, we're talking about a completely different level of, of celebrity endorser. You look at these athletes, and they are stars in their own right. When you're going to represent your country and win gold medal after gold medal, you might get a Wheaties box, you can get a couple Gatorade endorsements, and you really become this household name. 
In 2011, tennis player Carolyn Wozniak was named Forbes' second richest female athlete in the world with an estimated worth of $12 million. If you're looking for an athlete endorser now, you need a certain level of winning, a certain level of success. Let's not be naive. If they're nice looking, that certainly helps. She's a great athlete. She does a lot of advertising. So she's trying to diversify because she understands her career is not going to last long. The real challenge is what's the shelf life of your career? And if it's going to be five years or less, then not only does your money need to last you 50 years, but you also need to be able to start a business where you can continue you know, having streams of income and maybe help other people behind you follow in your shoes. Our appetite for sports is officially insatiable. So we may love Harry Potter now, and who knows what the resonance is. We may love a certain type of music that we'll laugh at in five years, but you know, sports ain't going away. No one, no one five years from now is going to say, what was that sport with the oval ball made of pigskin? Also making up a very prominent part of the young and rich club are the many often faceless entrepreneurs. You probably don't even know the person behind you is worth a billion dollars. My name is Cameron Johnson. I am 26 years old. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I started my first business when I was nine. Uh, I was making $50,000 a year when I was 12. Made my first million before I graduated high school. I had 12 companies before I was 21. Young entrepreneurs were thrust into the spotlight in the 2010 film The Social Network, which touched on this other type of young millionaire, the intelligent, focused, and potentially socially awkward internet entrepreneur. I think the Social Network was probably the first film that has sort of shined the light inside young entrepreneurs and inside their thinking. It's really brought some glamour to being an entrepreneur. The film added a spark of celebrity to the image of the young tech CEO. The mainstream press is trying to find out who the next big star is. I mean, we have, we have Zuckerberg, you had Steve Jobs. I think that's the big hunger. And I think USA Today and the New York Times and Wall Street Journal see that opportunity they see the readership spike when we do stories on celebrity CEOs. One thing that unites these young entrepreneurs other than hoodies is the tool they use to make their money. The internet instantly gives you access to a global marketplace. It instantly lets you start a business. If you're talking about uh, ways to make wealth over our generation versus every generation of our past, the only and the biggest difference is the internet. The onset of the internet unleashed a wild potential to create wealth and young millionaire entrepreneurs began to emerge as a force. Catherine and David Cook started at a young age. They're well respected in the tech community. They had a good idea, myyearbook.com. They were ahead of Facebook. Ryan Allen started Eye Contact and he's raised $50 million. Sean Belnick, extremely smart, started a business chairs business. Adam Witte, who started a publishing company in South Carolina. Aaron Levy at Boxnet. Drew Houston, he's at Dropbox. Dustin Moskovitz, who is a co-founder of Facebook. Peter Cashmore is the editor of Mashable. He has a huge following. Blake McCoskey started Tom Shoes. So these are all like potential stars in the making. I've grown up with a lot of young entrepreneurs, and I've been fortunate enough to know some of the smartest and the brightest and the, the wealthiest. We compete with ourselves as much as we're competing with our competitors, and I think that's what is really unique about a young entrepreneur. When it comes to the young and rich, one star has transcended traditional platforms of television, music, and film like no other. An endless line of merchandise has built her an estimated worth of $120 million. It's Miley, y'all. If you want to talk about filthy rich, that would be Miley Cyrus. She's made about $120 million over the course of her career since she was nine years old. Miley Cyrus is a talented girl. I mean, Hannah Montana was a phenomenon. With the phenomenal success of Hannah Montana putting her in the spotlight, Cyrus's off-camera activities began to land her in the tabloids, setting the stage for what appeared to be a very public party in the USA. Miley Cyrus is a very different kind of a star. You see her keep having the I mean really very very tiny scandals. She's photographed looking risque, she's smoking something, or she's pole dancing. Coming of age at the tail end of the era where young female stars were spectacularly self-destructing on a daily basis. High profile meltdowns and revealing exits from limousines raised the profiles of contemporaries like Paris Hilton, Britney Spears, and Lindsay Lohan. Miley's an interesting example because we, we don't really know what's going to happen to Miley. Is she going to be the next Lindsay Lohan or is she going to be okay? Is she going to graduate? Is she going to calm down and just continue making great records? Is, is she going to mature as an artist? I'm one of the few people who's going to sit here and tell you I enjoy me a Miley record. I enjoy the fact that Miley Cyrus on record actually sounds like a person singing a song. I, I, I really kind of like that. 
I really do. Miley could make it out of this. She could. Is she going to avoid drugs, avoid alcohol, avoid that kind of slippery slope? Because she has that family. Not, they're not necessarily bad parents, but there's obviously an issue of boundaries. In a 2010 interview with GQ magazine, dad Billy Ray Cyrus said his daughter's success made it difficult for him to control her and lamented the effect the money and fame had had on his family. Her father's Billy Ray Cyrus. He and her were estranged. He had a kind of crazy interview in GQ and said that um, Hannah Montana ruined his family and he felt like he didn't know his daughter anymore. She was trying to shed a previous brand image and she realized that she needed to rebrand herself as an adult performer. She doesn't want to end up like Lindsay Lohan. She doesn't want to end up being a Paris Hilton. She doesn't want her bad behavior. You know, when you have a brand, it only takes a few things to screw up that brand. I don't think navigating that transition from child star to grown-up star is easy for anybody. I think she's at a crucial point in her career. Someone who's gone through some ups and downs, but I think in general, those little bumps in the road have certainly not led to anything drastic. Um, she's come out on top. Not every young person can handle the pressures of having millions of dollars. Youth and a bottomless checking account can be a dangerous combination. It's a huge challenge um, for you know, stars to hold on to their wealth. You know, people blow it. The money starts coming in and they think it's always going to start coming in, so they're like, I can buy me a fur-lined sink. It's, it's, it's going to appreciate in value once I get some water on it, because it's my water. Lindsay Lohan sort of stands out as the example of what not to do. Everybody's going to point to the Lohans as a, a, an example of how not to do this. Those are the cautionary tales, you know? Those are the Lohan family. Lindsay Lohan also has a very unstable family. Lohan is like the horror story to end all the horror stories. The flash of the crotch, you know, coming out of the car. You kind of see the darker side of fame. You see it with Lindsay Lohan. If several years ago you had said, who's going to make it? Who's going to come back? Britney Spears or Lindsay Lohan? I would not have picked Britney. And I would have been wrong. I would have been wrong. In the history of young people becoming insanely rich, young people have walked the razor's edge between achieving success beyond their wildest dreams and ending up in court trying to divorce their parents. Your parents may be right there with you telling you what to do or not to do. Sometimes that works out. Sometimes you end up firing them. Kids need limits. It's extremely anxiety producing actually to not have limits and boundaries. Imagine being a parent and your kid is suddenly worth a hundred million dollars. I don't know how they deal with that. I mean, how do you suddenly tell your kid who's worth a hundred million that he can't, you know, go out to that party tonight? <laughs> not easy. Being young and successful, you have access to a lot more than a typical kid your age. They're at parties late at night that maybe have alcohol or drugs and things that they shouldn't be exposed to. I think family and your morals and staying grounded are probably the three most important things you can do as a young person. Well, Gary Coleman was the example. I mean, he all but divorced from his parents. I mean, he blamed them for his career problems. He was making $100,000 an episode for different strokes, but he wasn't getting any money from his parents. So he sued them when he was 18. He was basically selling off anything he had left as an auction because he was bankrupt. And he accused his parents of stealing from him. It's kind of a, a, a sad cautionary tale of what happens. You think about Drew Barrymore and Macaulay Culkin, who both emancipated from their parents in their teen years. Drew Barrymore is a perfect example of a celebrity that became way too famous, way too rich, way too young. She managed to get her life together and to go on to be a very successful actress. Now, perhaps Barrymore's perseverance and determination will allow for her to serve as a role model for others. Look at someone like Demi Lovato, who obviously had a lot of trouble dealing with all the things going on in her life. In 2009, actress and singer Demi Lovato seemed poised to join the pantheon of the young and rich. The star of her own show, Sunny with a Chance, she was just beginning to taste the riches associated with being a major teen idol. Demi Lovato got too famous too soon and just wasn't able to handle it. Demi had to go into rehab as she hit her uh, late teens um, just because she knew that she, and she wanted to get straight. It's a lot. It's hard for a kid. A lot of these child actors, they are given adult pressures. They're given adult paychecks at such a young age and it, it's very overwhelming for them. What most people probably don't realize is that it's a lot harder um, 
and full of much more angst than it seems. It could happen to any one of the child stars. For someone like Demi, realized that she needed to better herself for her future. She was smart enough to realize she had a problem, ask for help, and then get the treatment she needed. In the time that she's been out of rehab, Lovato has resumed her career as a singer, releasing her album Unbroken in 2011. However, her show, Sunny with a Chance, was canceled. I think any type of success is built on reinventing yourself. I think a lot of the young celebrities, they might make a strategic mistake, uh, maybe it backlashes, if the good ones learn from their mistakes and reinvent themselves. So I think that this, the group of young kids that we have today has really learned a lot from the bad mistakes of people like Lindsay Lohan, and they don't, you don't see them out at nightclubs getting drunk, you don't see them um, getting ugly in front of the paparazzi. They seem to be very professional, and when they appear in public, it's very stage-managed, they look great, they are very friendly. These kids are smart, you know, they're smart business people. They understand what an identity is, and they're going to build that and attract more people, more resources, more power. Right this moment, a brand new generation is learning from the current one on how to act, what to buy, and what not to do. It's a lesson that, if learned correctly, is very valuable. And when the torch is passed to the next generation of millionaires, the Chloe Moretzes, Kiki Palmers, Abigail Breslins, and Jennifer Lawrences, they will already be the beneficiaries of the experience of today's Biebers, Cyruses, and Swifts. So difficult to be successful, I think, in anything, whether it's being a celebrity, sports, or business, and it takes an inordinate amount of work. I think that's taken for granted. Um, I don't think the general public really understands how hard it is, and once you attain that success, it's probably harder to, to maintain it. Until wealth and youth cease to be the single most desired components in society, new young millionaires will emerge, fade, and emerge again. Their stories, spending habits, stumbles, and triumphs remaining fascinating to the 99% of us who watch, captivated by their narrative.